Um, I welcome to the stand Provia, uh, Professor Brian Espe, um, who's come all the way from uh, Dublin tonight. He's Associate Professor of Physics at Trinity College. He's going to talk to us about light pollution, something that Dorothy has already mentioned. Now, it doesn't really need explaining why amateur astronomers would be against light pollution. As every decade goes past, we see fewer and fewer stars. But Brian will uh, um, uh, tell us why, in fact, uh, the environment and animals and even human health can be impacted by light pollution. Um, uh, Brian is uh, uh, chair of Dark Sky Ireland, and he is uh, Ireland's foremost campaigner, campaigner against light pollution. And uh, we're very privileged to have him tonight, so please welcome him. <laughs> hey, Brian, you got your stuff good. Okay. Thank you, Peter. <coughs> Thank you for coming out, everybody. You could be doing something much more fun. Uh, so as the introduction said, uh, my background is actually in, in physics, or, or more recently astrophysics. And as part of observing the sky, I started as, as an amateur astronomer. Uh, you know, I realized that the light, night sky is an important her, uh, resource for us, a heritage item. And that we're at risk of losing that altogether. Now, while you know some tree-hugging environmentalists might be on one side, and and uh, you know isolated astronomers in their back gardens on another, this is a, it's something that affects all of us, and it's very important. And I think all of our roles are to get out there and, and pass information on, and to proselytize for protecting the night sky. What we're missing is is something in ter form of legislation. So, if anyone has got any inside track on on how to annoy local politicians or, or bring it up. I think you know that's that's a topic that could be pushed on again in the Cork area. You've got some very nice dark skies. Anyway, <clears throat> this is a, an image taken from space, and it, what I find interesting, and you know, this is indicative of development, if you like, of, of wasteful light. And you're starting to see pictures like this turn up in the background on news feeds or in news programs as well. You're getting to see it more common. You're getting to see it turning up in it, the sky, turning up in like AIB ads, the Skoda ad, where obviously to see the night sky better with your daughter, you get in the car with the lights on. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of education required, right? Um, but I think it's an easy win. There's, there are things where we can uh, influence people. If everybody talks to, say, six or ten people, that's a lot of people we can influence. And we have expertise we could pass on as, as astronomers. So what is Dark Sky Ireland? Well, its roots go way back. Um, there was, what got me involved really was uh, a European Dark Sky meeting in Armagh in 2009. And uh, Mark Bailey was, was one of the co-organizers, Albert White, who's on our committee. Uh, Mark Bailey had the epithet uh, of the Dark Lord or something, which probably I've inherited now. Um, but we were reconstituted in 2018 with stakeholders in the Irish case. <clears throat> with Heritage Council funding, we actually uh, became a, le a legal body, a CLG, Company Limited by Guarantee, uh, a few years ago. And we're using that because that gets a means for us to attract funding. You know, we have accounts and we have committees and we follow rules. And that's one of the things is to step up the quality of our work to match the level of, of work required to actually influence uh, the policymakers and, and people in general. So we involve with groups such as yourself, <coughs> obviously, um, researchers, uh, environmental groups, uh, local councils, uh, community groups. For instance, we're engaged with Clock Jordan, you know, local community group. There are islands off the west coast. Um, so there is a lot of interest in dark skies, not only from the astronomy point of view, but in terms of sustainability, environmental side, <coughs> and as something that is an important resource, as I said, that, that we're probably all conscious of losing. In my part, I remember as a kid um, going down the country and, and seeing dark skies, and as I came to, say, Blessington near Dublin, so was it 20, 30 kilometers out, there was a haze in the sky. Now I notice it occurring about 50, 60 kilometers away. Um, so it's, it's insidious, this development, and it's, it's something that we have to, to try and keep track of, otherwise we'll lose a resource. There are about 80% of, of the population in Europe doesn't see the Milky Way, about 90% of kids in the States, 
uh, and most of those then will go through their life without ever having seen a dark sky, and that's a horrendous thing. Um, it also, on the back of my head, I remember that when they had a power outage in, in the east coast of the States, there were a lot of calls to 911 because there was this silvery thing in the sky that looked really eerie, right? <laughs> and the cops had to learn astronomy and explain that it was the Milky Way that people in the city would never have seen. Okay. So we're familiar with the sky, but there are a lot of people who, who don't know what it is that they need to protect and look after, and that's part of our job, right? So <clears throat> engage with different groups. We're uh, affiliated with the Dark Sky International. It was formerly the IDA, but because we had Dark Sky R and DSI, they had to have DSI. I don't know. Um, so uh, Dark Sky International is, is the accrediting body for Dark Sky areas and, and gives us a certain cre credence then to, to the quality of our conditions. Uh, some more, so we're involved, uh, I was involved in setting up uh, the Mayo Dark Sky Park, uh, peripherally involved in Kerry and also in uh, Dava, which I'll, I'll show you on the map. So we support people who are working on the ground, <clears throat> and as I said, we see our main role now as, as engaging at a higher level to try and put in place protections for, for the people doing the work at the local level. So committee members also conduct research, including myself, uh, and citizen science, you may have seen something in the Irish Times, 2018, I think it was, and that's actually getting referenced, that publication on the back of it, you know, asking what people thought of this guy, whether they'd noticed changes at night, such as, you know, the behavior of animals, or, you know, might have noticed birds, particularly robins singing during the night, for instance. Um, and we've, we were lucky to get funding from the Heritage Council, including this year. Um, this guy you may recognize, uh, Niall Smith from... Uh, CIT, or oh, what are we now? University of the Western Side of Ireland, How's it? MTU. MTU, there we go, Munster Technological University. Uh, Ray Butler from Galway. Uh, <coughs> Georgia Macmillan is also one of the main instigators, was getting a Mayo Dark Sky Park off the ground. And Albert uh, White was one of the early members in, in the pre organization. Uh, we have a range. Uh, Mags here is, is our treasurer, and then we have people, Kate McGainey, involved with, with environment. This face you may have seen before. Hands up if you've seen this guy. Uh, there's a reward if you find him. Uh, when he comes back from the solar eclipse. But er I think everybody knows Terry, and uh, I think the usual thing is any, he always has his hand up first at the end of the talk. Uh, Joe Hogan, who uh, is an amateur astronomer as well as a, a CEO of a number of corporations, he helped get us into the European Southern Observatory. And Karem, who's a professional lighting designer. It's great to have somebody from the lighting side who understands how light can be done right. And he's recently won uh, uh, an award for work in Newport, which I'll tell you a little bit about. So what, what's the problem, right? So here's a, an image of Cork. Oh, it doesn't reproduce on your screen very well. Um, 2020, and you can see the, the white lighting in the, in the center, this sort of residential areas are fairly dim, old-fashioned lighting, so, high-pressure sodium lighting, but LEDs, these energy-efficient lights, as you, know, you may have appreciated, the fact that it's so cheap to get these lights and you can go down to Lidl and buy whatever's the cheapest, generally the maybe blue-white lighting and excessive amounts of, of luminance and may not be well-directed, You've probably, hands up if you've got a security light in your, shining into your garden or, yeah, oh, only, only a few of you, wow. It comes on and off. Oh, on and off, off. yeah. yeah. <laughs> my my neighbours goes on and off as the foxes go by. Um, but we're seeing a spread, not this is where Blackrock Castle is, but we're seeing a spread of lighting because it's so cheap to install and uh, you don't have to maintain them really. That there's been a spread in light, and what we really want to get in the, the light pollution agenda is actually consider the amount of light. One way I look at it is, if we're all probably familiar with David Attenborough and the, the programs about the, the ocean, and you find plastics in the ocean, right? So if we said we could produce plastic for a fraction of the price, do we go, oh goody, let's make more of it? Or do we go like, there are the downsides that we need to consider? But in light, there's generally not a consideration at all that maybe that you know, we need to actually control the amount of light, not just the cost of the light, but the amount of light that we produce and the impact it has on the environment. Oh, that's a better, better version of it. 
<laughs> so uh, here's a, a, an image of, of Ireland again from space. So <clears throat> one of the things we involved, <clears throat> inter involved with was with public lighting because it, we have control over the whole country. We can actually you know, appeal to get changes made, including through the road management office, which is based in, in the county offices here. And actually, if by influencing one big lobby group or group, then we could have a, a major impact across the country because the transition was being made over to public lighting. The main requirement was saving money and saving carbon. Now, the downside is you know, that if we produce this light, one of the reasons is to protect the environment and protect biodiversity. But by having the wrong type of light, it can have an impact about as large as, as you know, the climate change. So we need to consider how well we actually produce light and what type of light we produce. So we've been working with the RMO, Transport Infrastructure Arm, that deal with the motorways and primary routes. And you may have seen on the motorways as you travel, for instance, they've been implementing light reduction on some of the old, older design motorways. So you've, you don't find these kilometers of lights before you come up to a junction. They're now restricted. Those lights are turned off, left for a year, there are no complaints, no issues, then those lights are removed. It removes the infrastructure that you have to maintain. Um, actually, about 2%, I found in Germany, I think 2% of the accidents are caused by people running into lamp poles. So uh, getting them out of the way may help. Um, TII now also are, have got responsibility for greenways, and that's another issue where, you know, what we're seeing here is a spread of light out between the population centres. And if we're in a town or a dark sky area here, for instance, that light is sort of creeping in on top and reducing the, sky, the quality of the night sky, as Dorothea was saying. So our night sky limit is actually changing. The number of stars is prohibitively affected. So in the center of Dublin, uh, the sky is about 30 times, 30, 35 times the natural level. And we see about 150 stars. Right? Dark sky area, we, we see near perfect amount of sky. These are becoming an issue as well. This is a, a famous instant. I love this because it's you know, like a big brother thing. Um, you can see here that there are people living in these rooms here that don't have a choice. This was brought about as improving the area because they got the advertising agency to give up two billboards in town and clean up the town and instead put one billboard, an LED billboard, that had changing images which is driving these people nuts. Obviously, was not, this is a, a traffic junction. There's a triangle here. Um, not a good place to put in distracting advertising. But it's a money spinner for the council as well. right? So they say, well, you know, we can look after the parks if we have this monstrosity here. One of the issues we have, and, and also this, which is an LED billboard telling you how beautiful a Georgian building that never had that amount of light on it, um, which used to be the Department of the Environment, uh, or these in streets or in, in pharmacies, is these lights are horizontal. So that light propagates out into the near environment. It scatters off buildings and so on, but can be seen some distance away, particularly if these are elevated. And that is light that will go out. So not only you know, light that goes up basically creates a sky glow in the local area, light that goes out will actually propagate a long way. So the light from Dublin actually propagates down to near Glendalough. Right? So this is the sort of light that affects us. And if you think about that, if you have two big towns, then that light is sort of edging in and reducing the dark sky area in the middle, even if there's no development there. So it's over bright. It's a, I think it's a distraction hazard. This is, is a pretty picture, but only if it's on a TV maybe, but not when it's outdoors. Uh, particularly when illuminated at daytime levels. But as I said, there's, there's a social justice issue here as well, particularly if there's a lot of bright lighting in city centers. These people, if you're in a one or two bedroom apartment, where are you going to go to? You can close the curtains, it's really not going to do much good. And now I found even with my kids, you know, in the summers where it's getting warm at night, it can be quite warm if you open the windows. It's no point in opening the windows if the curtains have to be closed, right? So you can't really air the room without letting the light in. And we, we need to consider issues like this as becoming increasingly important on the world stage, social justice. Right? Is it right just because we're advertising something which maybe nobody needs, uh, which maybe they don't have time to observe? Does it need to be on in the early hours of the morning even? right? 
So this is, I think this is about six meters by six meters. So it's a few hundred thousand lumens. Um, this is the Dean, uh, I think, has it been fixed? No, okay. Uh, there's a little, should be a Batman logo up there. Um, we've got, this is the Mary McAleese Bridge. I, I think the first time I saw this at night, I thought it was a bat symbol because there was a little lo uh, figure of wings on the sky, but it's because they illuminate this structure and most of that light misses, so it creates a shadow effect on the sky. Uh, what I find is really ridiculous is that these lights here are full cut off so that no light goes up. Uh, and it restricts the light, very well designed, keeping with the road quality. But why in hell do you then have to floodlight a thing with big rectangular floodlights when it's, it's a very fill, uh, uh, small structure and right down the road from a UNESCO heritage area? Right. And it's also over the Boyne, and salmon are affected at levels at about a third of full moonlight levels. All right. So this is the joined up thinking. Some architects or somebody thought it would be really great to show how wonderful we are, what we're bringing to the country and development. And the planning people, the, the education people, the heritage people are not getting engaged on this picture. Right? Um, issues such as this, again, you can see that the issue with this is the horizontal emission as well, which will travel out, particularly if you're in a car park. That area, there's no nearby obstruction. That light will propagate quite some distance away. Sports areas as well. My own college got uh, lottery funding because they went up in the league. Uh, and you can actually see with the, the blue rich light, you can actually see the beam because it's scattering. This is really scattering off the, aeros the air molecules, right? So that's scattered out in directions. Uh, we've got like Croke Park. This is to help the grass grow, right, at night. And you consider that the fields have been used primarily in the winter months. You put up a big stadium that shields the grass, and it's Cessna grass, I guess, so it doesn't, can't cope with Irish weather. Um, but basically, it's not going to get enough light to recover, so they illuminate it. I wondered at first, I actually saw this image on a space station image, and I was a bit curious, but it's because of these rows of lights they wheel across the pitch, part of Parky Cueve there as well. Residential lighting you're probably familiar with, you know, and if everybody turned on a light outside, that would be sort of equivalent to the light burden of all public lighting. Because public lighting is a bit more controlled. And you're sending lights up. For instance, this place near me, you can see this one is under a, a cover, so it's restricted. But these seem to be fairly prevalent, these, these lighting uh, efforts. Uh, and again, another estate uh, with a security light. Um, is there any need to illuminate trees in your garden when you're not even outside to see them? Right? You're sitting in with your television. You feel like it makes my garden look good. Why? Right. <laughs> So it adds up, there's a cost to this, there's a carbon cost, there's a monetary cost, there's a, if you like, the, the impact you have on your surroundings. But it also, it's a little bit more innocuous, it creates, the, it's this feel good feeling, surely we could sell more light or convince you to go and buy more things for your garden, right? And everybody feels, well they have lights, I should have lights or whatever. Um, but it's a competitive thing, but we need to stop and consider, given the severity of climate change, and I think we're all really appreciating how much of an impact it is. Why don't we stop? Um, it's an easy win. It's something that's not necessary. Um, in terms of Ireland again, <coughs> where we have is the big issue is if this, I found this nice little diagram, the, the price for lighting in the UK, we can take it as pretty much synonymous with, with here. If you had to go and light a fire, <coughs> you had to go out and collect the wood. What's the cost involved with that? Right? It's going to be quite high. You're not going to do it that much. But when electricity came in, then the cost of lighting came down, and it was the flick of a switch. It's something that you don't even consider. And that has helped drive our 24-7 culture, along with some other aspects, you know, that we should have a nighttime that's just like the daytime. And particularly, maybe it'll get people in the center of cities, commercial activity and so on, more we, engagement we have, more light we have, more secure people feel. I don't know, I wouldn't walk down a Collins Street without looking over my shoulder at three o'clock in the morning, even though it is heavily illuminated. Okay, but there are these messages that people have built in. I think we all feel nice, warm glow. You know, if you took your, your dearly beloved out, 
you probably wouldn't put them under fluorescent light in a restaurant unless you wanted to have a cheap meal. Um, you want a warm glow that gives you a certain feeling of comfort. So light does have an impact on us, right? But we need to consider what the, the other costs of it are. It's, it's, you know, like bright light, smart idea, you know, bright idea. All of these things are sort of built into our culture, whereas, you know, dark is sort of got negative connotations. But it doesn't have to be that way. And here, you know, in pictures in the 19th century, you could see the sky. What would this look like with a couple of arc lights shining on here? <coughs> in uh, Europe, you go to 92, we can see us on the, the western seaboard. We step forward, you can see the general increase of light. Now, this is from a satellite that doesn't handle bright lights very well. So really, what it's emphasizing is the spread of light, the low-level light that moves out into the countryside, right? And you can see that, you know, the Benelux countries, for instance, you can pretty much impossible to find dark sky areas. And also with Holland, for instance, the greenhouses. But they are controlled in the amount of light that is, has to be emitted. Britain is further along the road in constraining light. They have light pollution laws. Ireland doesn't, right? So we have a little bit of resource here down the west coast, which is not developed. You can't build hotels up on top of bogs and mountains. Um, but on the other hand, that's a resource that we have that still remained intact. Uh, one of the other issues we have now is, of course, those are sites where you might put wind farms, and that has an effect on, on wildlife and birds, for instance, as well. So <clears throat> what's happened Irish light? If we look, the development of Ireland then goes hand in hand with the production of light. Uh, it, light correlates well with GDP, and also with population growth. And even when the economy sagged a bit, we still had a net immigration. We had a lot of Eastern Europeans coming in, particularly Poles. That helped boost the, re the requirements for light uh, and commercial activity, and light continued to grow. What happened then around this point is, this, this, these are the different sat uh, satellite, but what happened then is the introduction of LED technology so even though the light has increased, the amount of light going up into space has not followed suit. And this satellite isn't always say, sensitive to all the light that's produced. But we can see what's nice is always to have a comparison, a control sample. So Northern Ireland sort of stays pretty much flat. The, so just going from here to here, similar lifestyle, similar area of the world, similar weather, we can compare things side by side and get a real comparison. Then we can see that Ireland has really pushed up its light considerably above where other countries have gone. Strong commercial component, development of industrial estates, the data centers, the Amazon areas, Tesco hubs, whatever, on the outskirts of town that are uh, repopulating their, their shelves in the wee hours of the day. Uh, interestingly as well, it tracks population quite well, it might be expected, so smaller towns, we go up to Cork, and then Dublin, we can see we get this nice relationship between light level and population. Basically, the more houses we have, the more street lights we have, okay? Um, and as I said, if we look at it in this map for, for astronomers, then a magnitude per square arc seconds, then a city like Dublin is about 17.3, I think is what I measure, um, and then a dark site area might be about 21.7. So there's, there's quite a disparity and then a huge impact in the, in the amount of sky seen. But if we turn that on, the head, on its head, we can also say, well, if you're coming from Europe, what you really lack is a pristine sky, a dark sky. And if you notice this odd shape of Ireland is because the West Coast is not identified, it's not as lit up. So here's something we still have a sliver of. The next lights are in North, North America. So this is a resource that we have that we're in danger of blowing away, literally, with, with light. But yet, there's a tourism potential because our neighboring markets uh, can't actually see this. So we can actually sell this as part of our sustainable tourism. The other cool thing is, of course, and that sold it, I think, and, and Kerry, the tourism officer, took on board. There's about a million and a half people, or, or sorry, uh, yeah, about a million and a half would do the Ring of Kerry. Uh, or, and most of those would get in the bus, go down to Kerry, go back, have... Uh, lunch in Killarney, go back to Dublin. Big hotels, big chains, that's where the money's going. But if you get people to stay local, as you appreciate, most of the time it's cloudy, right? 
So you want to stay a few nights, you want to stay in a local guest house out in the countryside. That's putting money into local pockets. It's also, as, you, as was mentioned earlier, the time of the year that you get good skies is going to be in what the tourists call the shoulder season. So at the, the break between summer and, and winter, or in the winter season. So it's bringing in off-season tourism. And I talked to the park uh, director in, in Wicklow, and he said, the last thing I need, like a hole in the head, is more tourists in the summer. But if it could bring in people off-season, and I've got the place set up, I've got the staff, or where I would love to, to develop is like the Cade of Fields, I've got an architecturally uh, beautiful building, you've got a cafe, you've got parking, you've got uh, careful controlled lighting, you've got staffing, um, but that building's shut in the winter because it's not a tourist season. But just think what it'd be like is to look up at the night sky from inside one of those stone huts at the same sky your ancestors would have seen. I think that's something that can't be bought, right? That's something that creates this intense feeling. And as you appreciate when you go out and see the sky at night, it creates a bonding feeling with people because there's the dark around you. And it's something that the whole family can enjoy without needing a PhD in astrophysics, right? Or to know the names of all the stars. It's just that feeling you get that you're so insignificant, but strangely, at the same time, you're so engaged. You're part of that, right? You're part of all these foreign planets, exoplanets, all these supernovae, the expanding universe, isn't that wonderful? But if we cut that off from people, we never expose them to it, they don't even know that they should be protecting it. Right? They're not aware of what they're losing. So that's part of our job is to go and tell people. So in terms of the light levels then, again, these are a bit out of date and one of my projects is to update these. They're, they're, what you do is take the light coming up, you see with the satellite, and you have a model of how that light actually gets scattered and how much that affects the sky brightness then as a result. But the general field, this is nonlinear, um, so these are basically blown out. You're not going to do much about it. But the Milky Way, you can see more of that is disappearing from around the city. Um, and then pristine skies, really just this down the, the western seaboard and maybe a little bit into western uh, Cork. So we're sort of edging it out, right, as we go, and by producing these big hotels, floodlit, lit at night with glass windows or whatever. Um, just in case you're wondering if we're under attack, that's uh, the space station going over. This is uh, um, in Connemara. <coughs> What is light pollution? I, I've, I've talked about it, and I guess you have an innate feeling, but just to put it in, in some sort of context, we don't actually have a, a legal definition, but if we take on board sort of what you commonly accept. Um, what in the UK, for instance, they have a law of light trespass, so your neighbor's light shining into your window or street light, you can appeal to the council to have that dealt with, right? Um, we have glare, so you look at the light and we have too much light, Part of that's the problem now with the LEDs with the blue component in them, that affects our night vision. And under street light levels, our night and our day vision is active. Right? So the usual complaint when, people, when they introduce these LEDs is it looks brighter than it was. Yes, it does. Because it, before with the old sodium lights, they didn't affect your blue vision where the night vision is peaking, around 4,400 nanometers, uh, angstroms. Uh, so what you get is, is the night vision is much more sensitive, so it's, you're feeling like there's a lot more light, and even if it's strong, you feel your eyes sort of burn, right? And what could be done is lower that level, but the rules governing the light levels date back to the time when you actually lit a match or lit an oil lamp, right? They haven't sort of kept up to speed with the technology. So uh, they, don't, they ignore that con contribution. And that's an issue as well then, if we have those lights, then that's going to affect our night vision. So the area around lit areas with these LEDs, or as I was saying to someone earlier, big car dealerships with the floodlights, look, look at our fancy cars. The neighborhood then, your night vision is going to be badly impaired and your view of the sky is going to be badly impaired. The plus side is because it scatters so much in the atmosphere, you'll see a, a big glow over the area, but it won't travel a long distance but the other light will, the other colors. So if we look at, this is, is sort of a schematic of, of how 
they categorize the light from a, a public light, uh, street lighting. So this bit is sort of the useful bit that goes on the ground, and that's maybe a half to 80%. Right? The stuff that will bounce off the ground, we'll have to live with. But light that comes out sideways then, as I said, particularly if these lights are raised up, and some of the heights are commensurate with the heights of a typical Irish building, then that light can actually travel for long, long distances. So you can see these things a long way and affects your, your view of the night sky. Um, I've done some work on this. This is actually a map of Kilworth, not that far away. I passed on the way down. Um, what I did is with funding from Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, I thought one of the difficulties we have is to get our point across when you're dealing with basically accountants is you need numbers, right? So how much light goes up into space? What fraction of the light is lost? What proportion of the light goes out into the surrounding countryside? What will happen if I change the lights? What a percentage improvement? That needs to be quantified. No one was doing that. So what it, it took is luckily that a lot of these data <coughs> are free, <coughs> publicly accessible. Some of them are <coughs> LIDAR images, so like radar, but done with a laser. So you measure the height of structures. This is done at about one meter resolution. So trees, boundaries, and houses, <coughs> and then you get the public lighting database. You can put the lights in and create the, the map of where the light is and the, the obstruction. So if I view it from a satellite from an angle, how much light does the satellite see? So I can take the satellite data and correct it back and estimate the total amount of light, the total energy, the total cost. So that's one thing I could do. I can also work out what fraction of light can escape from the street out into the surroundings and so on. So I can do that. Um, so for a range of, of towns, uh, I can tell you the names you're really interested. But uh, what I estimated was in this crazy radiance unit is the amount of light produced for this range of towns and the amount seen by the satellite. And I get a, a fit, which is a slope of nearly unity, showing that there's almost a perfect agreement. So the model, different towns, different height buildings, different types of light, what I predict I should see from the satellite is very consistent with what is actually seen. What I can also do is, is if I've got data, the mapping data taken when the trees are in leaf and the trees aren't in leaf, what you can find is the light that's going up into space varies from about 86% in this case to about 53% because of the effect of leaves. This is a street in, in Dublin, uh, Marion Road, and is actually, um, some of the lights are actually in the trees, so it makes it even worse. Um, but you can play around with the model and produce the numbers that you can use to think about developing a better policy or to look at how much energy is being used. The impact, you know, as I said, goes into the wider environment. Uh, this is actually a view of Dublin taken from North Wales. You can see the parasites here. Uh, this is, Ray Butler took this in Connemara. I think there's the, the uh, zodiacal light as well. Uh, there's an image I took of Neowise from the Dublin foothills, almost lost but just about visible. And this, you can see the other thing I notice, even though it's gone whiter, it's not gone any dimmer, right? And if you look carefully in, in the original, then you can see there's, there's light streaming up into space. So this argument that this light is cheaper, better, more efficient, yes, it's producing light more efficiently, but it's not always putting it where it should be going. And if they were doing a good job, then the city should look darker. Right? So I'm about uh, 300 meters up, so I'm actually looking above the horizontal. There's still light from these new lights coming up into space. So large number of people live in areas we never get dark adapted even. Right? So if you go out, what I find surprising living in Dublin is even in the suburbs, you take your smartphone, you go out and you take a picture at night, you'll probably see color in the sky. Right? So even with a lens that that small, there's that much light coming from the sky that you've paid for, that in one thirtieth of a second you get an image on, on a smartphone. That's a bit scary, right? that there's that much light coming from the sky. Think how much harder it is to get a picture of the night sky in a dark area, how much special, more specialist equipment you need. So a large part of the country is affected, and it's shocking. You know, you go out next time, see if you can see the color in your hand or your clothes, whatever. 
and get a gauge for whether, how strong your, your daytime vision is active. Right. I guess, mind, mind you, few people realize you can read by the, by the full moon as well. You can read a paperback. But this light affects us as well. This constant light in the background affects our health because we're set up to, our bodies run with a whole range of different clocks. You know, the times you feel hungry, the times you feel a bit low energy, the times you feel, you know, maybe a little bit bleh, for no better word. Um, those things run at different speeds. There's all these different clocks in your body. But there's a master clock that says it's daytime, time to get going. May, it maybe occurs a little later in the day. Uh, but that actually resets all those clocks. And it occurs on a near daily basis. So it's a circadia, about a day, circadian rhythm. And what's interesting is this rhythm if you look at a whole range of, of species down to very low level forms of life, it's inbuilt. So plankton will move in the water column depending on the light. They don't want to be eaten, right? So it's not something that we as humans have built into our system or daytime, nighttime. It's something that's built into nearly all life. And what we're doing is tinkering with that. Remember that electric lighting has only come in since around the end of the 19th century. We've evolved over millions of years, and if you look at you know, lower forms of life, we're talking about billions of years that this system has been in, working. And now, in the last few hundred years, we've started changing it. We don't know the, the long-term consequences. But already, there are some issues related to diabetes, for instance, some, uh, both male and female cancers, and other effects as well, depression. We're, we're certainly familiar with SAD, you know, seasonal affective disorder. Or when, uh, you know, but the other side of the coin is if you have too much blue light, you know, uh, that, that is also a problem. It keeps our system on edge, if you like. I think that the way for, for science fiction buffs, I would say, is you know, I always think it's like the Borg, you know, you can do what you like once the Borg are asleep. Right? They go in and rejuvenate. That's what our body does at night, and that's the system we go into. It, our body takes over. When you have a cold, for instance, or you're feeling ill, you don't want to get out of bed, you don't do anything. Your body says, I need to repair, I need to flush the system of these radicals and so on that can cause cancer. I need to rebuild and repair. I'm putting my effort into that. I mean, think of babies when they grow. They use a lot of energy to grow. They're building up their system. And we're shortening our, our cycle. And if, if you are watching uh, devices or under exposure to light, it's about an hour and a half before your melatonin level that controls, the hormone that controls your body clock will settle back to the, the default level. So there are big impacts, particularly, as I said, when you think about the social justice, if you're shining these blue-rich lights and flashing lights in through a window, disturbing people's sleep at the bare minimum, maybe causing health effects on the larger scale. So that's the day cycle. Of course, we're familiar with the monthly cycle, you know, things sink in. We have natural cycles. We're aware of it when we want to go look at the sky. Um, if we go to somewhere um, like Mayo Dark Sky Park, so these are, was mentioned, Dorothea mentioned sky quality meter readings. So this is date along here. I need to get a better graph, but this is sufficient. So each strip here, this is called a scotograph. So it's a measure of light. So each vertical strip is one night. So the color tells you the intensity. So there's twilight. And then as we go through the night, well, ooh, the moon comes up, so it gets a bit brighter. Here's a bit in the, with the dark of the moon. Twilight gets dark, and then twilight, it gets bright. So you can see the moon, because the moon moving through the sky, then you get this bright patch during the night. If we go to the, the city, it goes from there to there. This is on the same scale. So you can see there's a huge disruption in the, in the zenithal brightness as I said, in the, this is from Trinity, or sorry, this is a suburban site. Trinity is even worse. Um, so this is actually, you can see the change of twilight then during the year, and you can see that it's all over the place. So you're losing this natural rhythm in the sky brightness, which has a knock-on effect. Of course, we know on things like moths, insects. There's a big population crash in insects. Moths are actually big pollinators, it's just we don't appreciate it. All the effort's been put on, on bees, but it's in the National Pollinator Plan now we realize that light pollution has an impact. 70% of the mammals are crepuscular or, or nighttime animals. You go up into the woods at night, you'll hear deer around. 
Okay, you see badgers, you see foxes, and so on. So a lot of the mammals also work on, on a nighttime cycle. Migrating birds will use light as well, can get disoriented. So this is on a, a, a research site in Germany, but it's the same sort of deal. Clear sky, cloudy sky, we get this amplification of light. What's important in the Irish case is, of course, it's about two-thirds of the time it's cloudy. So in the old days, you know, when your grandparents were growing up, we, we had below natural skies. You think you have a, a thick layer of cloud, you don't see the stars, you don't see the Milky Way. So the conditions you go out are pitch black. Nowadays, when we have artificial light, that white cloud you see during the day is also reflecting the light at night. So instead of having a natural sky, we have a supra-natural level. So instead of going from sort of typical sky, but most of the time it's darker, now we go from not even typical sky to much, much brighter. Right? So we've actually flipped the thing on its head. We've made the problem much, much worse. We've disrupted the, the cycles. And that's something, again, we're familiar with in astronomy when we do our observations and so on, but we're losing that. Um, this sort of follows on from what Dorothea was saying. I, I always had trouble finding constellations in a really good sky. I don't know if anyone else has that. They're just, all the stars seem bright, right? Or when I've gone to observatories, it can be hard finding your way around, right? It's uh, easier learning astronomy in the city because you have much less stars to remember. But from our point of view, the take-home message I want to give you is you remember that, for instance, we take all stars like the sun and we spread them out in space. Then as we go out in space, if we go down a certain distance and the stars are fainter than that we see, remember the volume is increasing a lot more. So as we look at fainter and fainter stars, typically there are more and more of them, right? Or conversely, if I then cut those off from your view, there's a dramatic change, and that's what happens here. So we change the naked eye limiting magnitude. There's a huge change at the faint end. A little bit of light in the countryside is going to have a big impact. So a few bad sources of light near your, your observatory is going to have a big impact. In the city, it'll be lost in the noise. But where we are then is if we've still got dark sky areas in parts of the country, if we're not careful, just adding even a little bit of light is going to dramatically change those skies forever. The good point, or could be forever, the good point is, of course, we have a light switch. So it's possible to stop that light. Okay? But what we should be considering is which light we want. The light that's traveled thousands of years to us, or the light that's come from the neighbors. So the other consequences, you know, just environment, as I said, there's this natural cycle, the whole range of species uh, that are affected, including ourselves. There's a lot that's not known. In fact, when I talked about this circadian rhythm, the sensor in your eye that's triggered by the blue light, so when you throw back the curtains, you go, ah, oh, sunny day, I feel good. That was only discovered in the 1980s. Right? And people argued it couldn't exist because people had dissected the eye for centuries. But late 80s, 90s, it, it became accepted. Right? We're still learning how our system works. And we're more and more aware of how interconnected things are. It's not just your genes. It's how your genes are expressed. It's how you live your life. It's how things interact with you. But really, our environment in terms of the nighttime hasn't really been integrated into that study. It's a hard thing to do, but it's, it needs to be, we need to be aware of it. And the sensitivities can vary quite a lot. The other thing we don't really think about, of course, is the world doesn't look like this to every species, right? We only see a little part of the spectrum. Some women, I think more common in women, actually have four color sensors. That's maybe why you can be a little bit pickier about mauve and purple, right? But most of us have three sensors. Bees, for instance, have a sensor in the ultraviolet. Right? So the world doesn't look, we think, okay, it looks fine to me. It's not always the same way for an insect that's more sensitive. It might see a glaring source. So, for instance, those LEDs that have failed, I don't know if you've seen any of those, they're really intense violet color. To a, a, a moth, they'd be horrendously like searchlights. Right? So these have impacts on all species 
and we just haven't done enough research to appreciate how many. Um, and this just indicates one of the issues we have here. The uh, candle, you know, as I said, the romantic dinner for two. Most, the reason we drop these sort of incandescent uh, bulbs and candles is they're very inefficient. And you're aware, like your bulb in the old days, the bulb goes, you go to change, you burn your fingers because there's so much heat radiation. So we've gone for more efficient ways of, of making light. Um, but the problem is, this is more or less where our eye is sensitive, this sensor that, that controls our rhythms. It's also where our nighttime vision peaks. And if we add in these LEDs, particularly these blue-white ones, cool white sometimes called, because they're bluer, um, then this has a big impact. And uh, Stay away from those. Look for something named warm white, for instance. So incandescent or halogen. You know, halogen is used, for instance, in shops. You go to a clothes shop because the colors look about right. Sometimes you find you bring things home. It looks weird. You've got the shop. Maybe you have blue-rich lighting. Um, and we can get replacement of these organic LEDs. You can see that they don't have this blue peak. And the spectrum is more balanced like sunlight. It's what we're used to. So it has this effect on cortisol as a stress hormone, growth hormone, and so on, cycles with, with melatonin. Yeah. Um, there's other effects as well. You said the natural world. We did um, with the Irish Astronomical Society. We had two sky viewings in Nauth. That was super cool. Uh, you know, you're beside these this monuments. It's been occupied from you know, Stone or Bronze Age up into the Middle Ages, and you're looking at the sky. It's not a great sky, mind you, but just to be there at night and to experience it, again, it pulls people together and you get the feeling you're part of, of history. That's the great thing about the night. It brings people together. Um, so it, we, we disconnect, you know, we don't use our senses to the same extent. We don't feel engagement. I mean, you walk down a street that looks the same as it does during the day. You know, what's the big deal? You know, and I have more flashing signs at you. Um, but the night sky is something that's visceral, right? And that's something you don't get from looking at an iPad or looking at a TV. And that's another case. You know, it looks like a sunset, but it's not. Believe me not. It's only three colors. Okay. So this nighttime outings, if you do open nights, you get people the, the fact that you might get one or two people go like, wow, I never saw that. You know, the first time I saw Saturn, it looked like it should be on a string. It's just like, why should it have rings and just sit there? Why don't they fall off, right? So, you know, when you're a kid. You know, these sort of things are things that impress people. These are the things that leave long-term impressions and make people curious and make people want to engage, make them want to write poetry, whatever. Okay? So sense of wonder is important, and I think that's probably why you do it. I worked with the Hubble Space Telescope in Baltimore and Maryland and you know, always thought if you weren't awed once in the week by some of the images, right, there was something lacking in you. Right? Yes, they're scientific. Yes, you get a lot of measurements. But if it didn't just impress you, if you didn't feel like, wow, I just, you know, I just have to look at it and enjoy it, um, you were missing something from your soul, I think. You know? Um, there's also this precautionary principle, which is at the EU level. There's more EU directions coming down to look after the environment. Why should we do something? We should have a reason to do something. We shouldn't need to, that we tell people that they can't do something or not to do something. There should be a reason for action, and there should be precaution to actually do less, to produce less plastic, to produce less pollution, including light. It's not on our agenda yet, but we're working on that. So that's a star party, you know, Van Gogh with an overcast sky wouldn't quite work, right? So the future, <clears throat> one hope, you know, is, is we can make incremental gains. So this is in Newport and County Mayo. It's on the edge of, of the Mayo Dark Sky Park. Um, and the town of about 6,000, uh, we thought, you know, it could do lighting better. Georgia got the engagement of our community, so everybody got on board. It was explained what would be the case. We'd move to better quality lighting. We'd reduce the level of lighting so it wouldn't have an impact on the park. Here's the church, and this isn't even one of the worst cases. The church sits on a hill, and for energy efficiency, they went from really bad, really bright floodlights to really bad, really bright LED floodlights. It saved a lot of money. But really, it's not the way to light a church. Right? Look how much light is being missing. 
And in the tower, there are actually swifts. So the swifts come in. They don't want to leave when the light is on because they're, they're uh, at risk when they're just about to take off. So owls will take them, catch them. So when the bird is coming out of the little hole and ready to jump, it's very, very vulnerable. Right? It hasn't got airspeed yet. So the birds won't come out until they're really certain that they have to. If they come out too late, the same with bats. If they come out too late because the sky, the twilight is extended, they miss the insects. Right? So it has an in impact. So this is the old lighting and this is the new lighting. It's won an award recently. So you can see it's much more sensitive. It doesn't illuminate the facade. Um, and there's windows here, the Harry Clark windows. By having light inside the church, you can actually see the beautiful windows. Right? Um, nice thing I did is actually look at the, some of the satellite data. So there's the original data. And then they made changes to the road. They brought in uh, new LEDs and warmer white LEDs. The floodlights went off. Overall, the effect is a drop of about 50% in the light going up from this town. A saving of about two t tons for the church of carbon dioxide a year, about 10 tons for the whole town from the public lighting. And there are other implementations then in terms of the shop window lighting and so on. So there's a better way we can live which makes the town more amenable, makes it more in encouraging to be in at night, saves the environment, and it actually is a lot attractive, more attractive. I see if the, oh, I thought I had the Harry Clark picture. Um, but the stained glass, if you illuminate it from the front, it just looks like black. If you illuminate it from inside, then you can see the beauty of this church, of the windows, even when the church is shut, right? And low level of light, sensitively done to bring out the texture of the church and to illuminate the walkways. But you can see the light is much more comfortable. As I said, you know, if you want to sit in a hospital waiting room and have your candlelit dinner or go somewhere where the, the ambience is much better, this is sort of the equivalent. Um, so seriously, you really, and the other thing, there was this floodlighting. There was a car park there, so as you drive in, you were hit by floodlights. Um, so the overall image then is, is, this is gaining currency. I go night walking myself. You don't even need a head torch once you get used to it, well, if you live near a city. Um, half the park is after dark is gaining more traction. Why protect an area during the daytime if the animals are disturbed at night and not able to, to engage as they would? Um, in our citizen science surveys, about 80% said people would engage. I guess you find yourself if you have open nights or get people to join your society or people. You know, my, my trick is, is uh, if you go somewhere, it's the taxi driver test. If you go somewhere and you say you work in uh, nuclear physics, you probably won't have much of a conversation with a taxi driver. If you say you do astronomy, there's somebody who will have a question, right? So it's interesting. Uh, it also, the thing to remember is we're paying for this, right? Like the water, which I still haven't worked out who's paying for that. Is somebody paying for that, please? Thank you. Um, this light uh, that's used in our name is a cost in the system. We're paying for it, even if it's insensible, right? We don't know it. It's an environmental stressor. It can have an impact maybe as large as climate change. So it affects bud burst in trees. It affects birds singing at night. It disrupts the ecosystem. It affects our health. Why not back off from that? Um, but in our sense, you know, it connects us to the sky, it connects us to history, it connects us to each other, connects us to, to the stories, finding your way around the sky, talking about you know, ancient civilizations and thinking, this is what they see. Why did they come up with that? Oh, I can see that figure. You know, there's Hercules, whatever, right? It connects us with that. And it's, it's something that, you know, this button, you know, we can turn it off. We have the power to turn it off. We have the power to turn it off. Uh, in terms of dark sky areas, you're looking one. The uh, oldest is, is Kerry Dark Sky Park. Uh, it's, or, or sorry, reserve. I need to be careful. Um, it's not a park. Um, so there's actually an extended area around here, but the core of the park, that's really dark sky area, is about 235 square kilometers. Um, Mayo Dark Sky Park is more recent. That's expanded slightly, and it's 171, so it's, in, it's part of the national park, so it's part of the the whole ecosystem protection. This has got towns and roads and stuff inside it. Uh, the most recent one is, and you have to look carefully, is um, apparently they decided, they obviously had, had some experts give their opinion, so um is the sound of the universe. 
you probably didn't need me to tell you that. I'm not sure why it's, I guess it's a big um. It's in Davos, Dark Sky Park. Uh, it's got the Begmore uh, circles in there that have uh, aligned sort of like the Cade of Fields that were under the bog. They are loosely aligned with uh, moon and sun phenomena. So we do have dark sky areas. I thought I'd point them out because I think still some people are, are unaware that we do have these conditions. Um, in terms of what actions we can do, you know, we can turn the light off is the first one. Do we need it? Right? If we do need it, then don't use blue rich light. Right? Use a warmer light. Um, illuminate what you need to light, light. You know, if it's a path, illuminate the path. Don't illuminate the whole garden. Um, I keep seeing like security lights that are tilted up because I think if they're shined down, it's just too bright. So you, you spill a lot of it up, it goes somewhere else, right? Um, not the way to go. And, and they're designed with symmetrical uh, emitters, so half the light is going up. Um, use it when you're required. There's a switch. Put it on a timer if, if you tend to be forgetful, you know, and, and dim it to the lowest level you need. Besides which, security lighting that shines in your eye is not secure. I mean, there are areas in my neighborhood, when I'm on the far side of the street, the security light comes on. And when I know I'm coming near it, I look the opposite way. I'm never gonna see anyone at that point because it creates such deep shadows, but there's no way I'm gonna look at that light, <clears throat> right? So it's sort of self-defeating. If you think about it, and, and we recommend it to the Acres program with the rural development, it's going to be a lot more off-putting to have a dark haggard with machinery in it that people could steal. Because if it's lit, you know exactly where things are. If it's dark, do you really want to walk around a haggard in the dark? Right? Well, you must... You need to turn back to the guardian. You... <laughs> and they're the ones that are telling people to put up the floodlights. <coughs> we, we'll have a conversation with them. Yeah. I know with the guards as well, at one point certainly they were recommending if you need security and light in your house, inside is better. Right? Outside will tell you there's no car there. Right? Inside, if there's a low level of light, somebody might be in the house. So again, a lower level light, more constrained, is probably going to do a better job. And that was the feedback from people in, in the UK. We didn't do it here, but asking prisoners, what places would you stay away from next time? Right? Now, did they give an honest answer is a good question. But you know, the, the feedback was, um, did anyone want to guess what the most off-putting things for a burglar are? Two most off-putting. Dog. Above that. No. Nope. No. Nope. What what were we what was the endemic thing in, in Irish towns you always got afraid of and you went up to someone's house? The twitching curtain. Surely the twitching curtain. Right. I see you got a new man. Right. So I think we're, we should be familiar with this then, you know, it is a feeble light, it has a small impact, it's a tiny amount of light that comes down, but just think of what an impact it has on us, right, and what an impact it has on the environment. If we blow it away, we light all this view up, you know, it wouldn't look the same. So I want to say thank you to the Heritage Council for, for funding Dark Sky Ireland work and, and the Newport work, the initial phases of it. And SEAI, if there's anyone in the audience, I'd like more money, but uh, um, for, for helping me, you know, quantify in, in terms of the research. Okay. Um, please look at our, our site. There's some sheets there, handouts. Uh, if you want to find the site, we have quite a nice site, uh, and we're always uh, willing to engage with questions or, or groups. Um, so have a look at what our strategy is. We're trying to work through this, and if anyone wants to get engaged with us, you know, do get in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. The, these are the, um, the, these are the leaflets that uh, Brian mentioned there on the front here. You said. Now, uh, we have some time for questions. What I'll do is uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll collect two or three questions together. Um, and then put them to Brian. So who wants to put that hand up first? Uh, okay, uh, we'll have uh, Pat first and then John. Pat, yeah, yes. Should a yeah, change should be considered in certain 
I feel them as they come, or you saving them up for me? Because okay. I, I just heard that one, so I can answer it. Well, we'll, 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 we'll do it in turn. John wants to say first. John, well, oh, sorry, John, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, right. Is there a resource for items, for instance, like um, reflectors, that you apply to existing floodlights, that you could get your neighbours to put on their lights to redirect the light down? Because you see a lot of the new lights, yep. the, the, the energy lights, they don't have the depth that the old reflectors used to have. Yep. So you're depending on just the trajectory from the LED itself, which is about 45 degrees. Mm -hmm. So even if a person puts their floodlight almost pointing at the ground, it's still, is there a GO of <laughs> uh, reflectors you can add onto them to just to add that to, to reflect that last back down onto the ground? Are you aware of any such resources? Okay, there's two separate questions, and we'll, we'll, we'll take the Pat's uh, question on planning permission first. All right. The planning, I think, is, is a prime time to, to get engaged on these conditions. And what, what we want to do is actually get some light pollution legislation enacted, because that's about the only point. That and the county development plans. Some counties have a development plan that includes what they're going to do about lighting and, and how they're going to control it. But um, unfortunately, if it doesn't happen with planning, there's very little to bring it back in, right? So what we want to do is get things in place so that it's, it's a policy across the board and you can point to a law uh, or you know, a, a minimum or a ma or maximum amount of light that should be used in particular circumstances. But it, it is a weak spot. You know, again, we were talking about this earlier, you know, even talking to Eamon Ryan, you know, who's in roads, environment, and green for the moment. Uh, that you know, it's hard to get engagement with them, and they didn't engage with the European Council or meeting that fed information to European Council. But my colleague Georgia Macmillan was there representing the Park Service, so there's very little engagement at a high enough level, and it means everybody's doing their own thing independently, and it depends on individual applications. So the individual lighting engineer and the individual environmental planner, and there's there's no horizontal integration of, of this so that if we're going to put in a, a new data center then environment wants to know about it and you know take it take some action so yes it would be we do need legislation but there's very little aside from planning and that depends on active planning departments uh, and, and you know what the area is categorized on so in Wicklow for instance I know um, under COVID I guess they, they put in new paths between two towns about 20 kilometers apart, you know, concrete paths. So heaven knows what the embedded carbon was in, involved in producing the cement. And I know the next thing probably will be putting up lights along it, right? You know, but that's because money was there and they wanted to spend it. But it wasn't, didn't have oversight from someone saying, is that the thing to do, right? Is there enough footfall? Should we spend the money in other directions? Or you know, produce. You, you can have dark sky areas or, or reserves within a city or on the edge of a city, just to give people a feeling. You know, where you try and protect an area. That, for instance, you could do, a, a sky show or something. Right? It doesn't have to be a really pristine dark sky site. It's something that needs to come down into all levels of of society that we think about. Again, because of the importance of the environment, the crash of insect populations, the change in in climate, the temperature. Um, and that needs, you know, a national policy. But that's something that they're shying away from. But I'm holding a meeting Friday week in Trendley. I'm trying to get uh, stakeholders involved, hold their feet to the fire. Um, now, John had an interesting well, question about the availability of hardware to stop unwanted and unnecessary spread. Yes and no. Yeah, yes, and in, in, in there are approaches for particular lights, and uh, my local lighting engineer, for instance, said when she orders up new street lights, she orders up a proportion of shields. Now, this does, is not propagated so anyone knows about it, but for instance, it's shining into your back garden. You can complain and, and have a shield installed. If it's a private light, unfortunately, the no part is there are so many different types of light. There's a, an awful lot of stuff coming from China, for instance, 
which is under no control and probably is not amenable to fitting. What I suggested for Mayo but wasn't done is, for instance, you've got men's sheds. Somebody, so for instance, bulkhead lights are an, an easy case. You could produce a fitting. It would be something small and cheap. It would make an instant impact without someone having to change their, their fittings over, right? Um, but because it's, it's not always possible to attach something post in, in installation, that might be an issue. But um, I would say any time there is an issue with light pollution, the first one that would be recommended is engagement. And a lot of it is, is just not people not being informed or not realizing it. I didn't realize it was shining in your window or whatever. If it's a council, ask the lighting engineer to, to put in a shield on your, stop it. So I did it for my house. And they said, well, look, the light level's low. And I said, but here it is. I took a picture in the room with the curtains open and it shone straight onto my, my daughter's bed, right? Um, because you don't tangle with a physicist who has measurement devices and fixtures. Uh, she learned from that and wouldn't talk to me for a while. Um, but, uh, you know, you engage, you may be able to make progress. It may be a question of people just not knowing. It may be a question of, you know, I think it's security, but, you know, that has been shown not to be the case. As I said, in Connell Street, brightly lit area, I wouldn't walk down it at night. And part of the problem with the security thing is this conflation of dark, where a lot of the areas where there's issues in, at night, not feeling secure, there are, what you need to do is match it, what's the feeling during the day? All right, so walk down a column street where people are doing drugs or you know, knocking you over the head to take your handbag, you know, that happens during the daytime. It's not a nighttime phenomenon. It may get it emphasized because of the reduced number of people. But this gets to be conflated. Dark is the thing. Light is good. Dark is bad. Right? It's not always as, as clear cut as that. Case in the UK when they went to, to trimming and dimming, uh, the Tory, sorry, Telegraph um, newspaper. It had a somebody. I, mu I must get a copy of it. Had a case. You know, Labour Council turns off lights. Huge increase in crime. You know, next day, correction to yesterday's report. Actually, the crime figures went down. <laughs> um, so it, it's off-putting, and there's been no evidence that, that dropping the light has actually led to increase in, in road accidents or uh, burglaries and crimes against the person. It is a bit tricky with, with crime, though, because now the data are anonymized, and you get, certainly in the UK, it's to one square kilometer, so you can't match it up. So if you think of a, a city, it could be the dark alleyway or it could be the main street. You won't know when you actually look at the statistics but it's not as, as clear-cut as, as people believe. And we all know that belief, believing you won an election, believing that light is good, um, you know, it's not sufficient. You need facts. Right? Sorry, but there's no simple answer to that. <clears throat> yes, I see you. Do you have any opinion on car manufacturers? Hmm. Have yes. Have you designed this <laughs> cars also, the lights, the front lights in cars are very interfering for drivers at the moment. Mm -hmm. Do you have any opinion on that? Yes. <laughs> um, my <laughs> colleague George is. Well, just connect one more question <laughs> before we go on to that. Was there another hand up? No? Okay, uh, cars then. My colleague Georgia is very embarrassed because the Park Service got her an e car, so she rocks up to these dark sky events with a. Yeah. Sorry! <laughs> it's it's uh, again it's another uh, commercial side of things yeah. and uh, as a, a cyclist I, I even the cycle lights I have to look away because some of those lights the surface the, the surface brightness is higher than the sun some cars are near uh, lasers right and the addition of the lights and and you can tell actually with the cars I don't know why it actually ignores, it flies in the face of actually your understanding of how eyes work. Because if you look, for instance, at the, the indicator and the brake light, now sometimes they're one inside the other, the eye works on contrast. It's not light level. Right? So for instance, I have a piece of paper, white paper, and I hold it up here, and I turn a searchlight on it. You won't see the white paper, even though there's plenty of light. Right? But if you change the angle, the contrast, the shading would tell you there was a piece of paper here. Right? So it's not the absolute light level, it's the contrast. And when we have the indicators, one inside the other, the difference between amber and red is small, right? But 
That's what car manufacturers have done. They put lights all the way along. You can't tell what you're supposed to be looking at. But certainly when you get it oncoming in your eyes, um, it's a glare issue. And the issue, as I and everybody else get older, is as you start to get cataracts, blue light scatters more. So again, it's a social justice issue that you're mitigating against the older part of the population, which we realize is increasingly large, right? by producing these gimmicky lights, right? because you can. Right? And it's also, to my mind, if you remember the old days when you were going to France, for instance, you put an amber screen in the headlight, it goes through fog better. Right? So we've gone more to blue light and intense light. It's not the intensity, it's the quality of the light and where you put it. And just shining it out in all directions is not good. Whereas, in fact, actually, the older light, which cast a little light, you could see the ditch. Now you're, you're looking like that. Um, and, it, and I'm cycling, I have to look away. Right? Even, even with an oncoming cyclist. Because when the light strobe, it's even more intense. I, I heard, I, I think it was last week, I heard on the radio, uh, that the EU are actually going to start looking into these high-intensity lights and the bright lights on cars because of that exact issue. Yeah. That people are blinded essentially by them. Yeah, it's, it's, I think they're much more aware. There was a campaign in Belgium, for instance, on this. Uh, and I remember a colleague at, at the European Dark Skies meeting in, in uh, Mayo talked about it. They thought, oh, there's an accident black spot. There's a bit nasty bend in the road in Belgium. So they lit it, and there were more accidents. <laughs> because, like, oh, I can see, I can do that. You know, they're speeding through it. So they took the light out again, and the accident rate dropped, right? You just had to illuminate it properly. But, you know, if you put too much light, encourage people to drive. I also found near me, because near a shopping center, they come out of the shopping center, they don't turn the lights on because they don't realize there's no light, yeah. right? Because it's all so lit up, uh, it's, it's impossible for them to detect it. But, uh, you know, there's certainly a serious issue with, with uh, car lights, and, and as I said, even cycle lights, and the profusion of those. I mean, when I find lights moving around, I realize the cyclist is looking around, has one on his, a red flashing light on the front, and I, it's too much for my head, because red should be on the back. But the car lights, have, are, it's, it's a war. We have more than the other guy does, right? Uh, it's not necessarily better. I mean, it's the same thing if you buy a car one year. Remember when I was, I was renting cars in the States, be perfect, you could reach everything. And then the next year they change it, so you had to stretch, you know. It's, it has to be different, it has to be novel. The Skoda ad, obviously sitting in a car and looking, being in the car looking out is better than being outside looking at the sky. It's crazy, right? We know it doesn't make sense, but you can convince people they're feeling much better, nice and warm inside the car with the engine running to keep warm. Now, there's not going to be time for everyone to ask that question, but in a few minutes, uh, I'll be inviting you down here for tea, and then uh, you'll be able to come and buttonhole um, Brian with your question but, but Brian there's one question I want to put to you and that is you, you mentioned certain micro actions that people can take Yes. but on the big picture on the big picture what would you like uh, people to do to support the work of Dark Sky Ireland and generally to take forward the issue of light pollution Right, I, I think what's, what's important as I alluded to earlier is we need legislation and certainly if you know your councillors or TDs is to put your boots on the ground and to make it known. And it, particularly if you have some TDs that you, you know are amenable. I know I've had cases before where somebody says, oh, I'm next door to this person. We, we, we agree on this topic. And a question is raised. It's very difficult to escape a question. You know, do you not agree that reducing light would be beneficial to the environment? No, I don't. You know, get more light out there. It's, you can finagle it so that they have to answer and have to address it. And if you get enough questions, then some action might be taken. It, it goes up. But the fact is most of us don't engage. So therefore, it's, it, when you don't have a topic, they'll go and find a topic that they can address. But certainly, you know, in terms of your local area, engage with your lighting engineer or environmental officer. Engage with your councillor. I think we, we should fire up the, the Cork area, dark sky plan again. And uh, if you know of people at, at the TD level or, or ministerial level, certainly I would be happy to, to engage with them on that. I think, you know, 
it's been aware to me when I speak to groups, there's usually somebody comes up saying, I, never, I, I sort of knew it, but I never saw it like that, or I didn't know that aspect of it. A lot of the issue we have is education. And when it's explained, you can see how the pieces join together and how it makes sense. It's just that you have this innate feeling that, you, that somehow the dark will look after itself, and there's always more of it. You know, but as you can see from the maps, we're running out of dark. Right? It's something we grew up with. And, and George's mother, a quote that she had sticks with me. She said, I only became afraid of the dark when she moved from Mayo to London. Right? Once you were in a bright city, it's the dark alleyways that scare you. In the countryside, it's yours, right? It's part of your environment. But when you move to an alien environment, then it has a different feeling to it. And I think that's something that we need to embrace again as astronomers, embrace the dark and encourage people to engage with it. I think there is a, a, a groundswell, especially post-COVID, to experience, right? Not just to look at a TV, but to experience these things and to be able to engage like at these events with like-minded people. But as I said, the other key is, is the generational thing. You can explain the sky to a kid. You can explain the guy, the sky to an octogenarian, right? In some level, you can tell stories. You can tell the wonder of it. So it's not specific to a particular education or a particular level or a particular type of population. And that's something we all need to to do, as well as turning the lights off. Mm-hmm. All right. Now the time has come for the vote of thanks. Uh, Brian, uh, Cork Astronomy Club deeply appreciates the fact you came all the way down from Dublin to talk to us. Uh, we appreciate also the work that you're doing um, uh, on the pressing issue of light pollution. And I have under the desk here a little gift to express our gratitude. So please accept this on behalf of the club. <laughs> No, it's quite dark. <laughs> now, I have in my hand a little piece of an apple tree, which I'll ba- be banging on the desk in a couple of minutes. But before I do, um, uh, just a reminder to uh, anyone present who is not a member of Cork Astronomy Club that we would welcome your application to join. Uh, you'll find the subscriptions um, on the front of your leaflet. Uh, if you're not quite ready to join, but you'd like to keep in touch with us, we have a guest bulletin and the leaflet explains how you can sign up for that. Just a few reminders, uh, the rocket workshop...